Hello? This is he. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll be right there. I'm here to pick up Alden Call. Did you fill this form out? We'll notify you of a court date within 30 days. Dad, I know I messed up and I'm sorry. Come on, bud. Let's get you home. All right. Have you ever been criticized for attempting to do what you thought was a good deed? Uh, most of us have probably been there in some way, and if you have been there, then you can identify in some ways with the woman uh, in our text today. In fact, you can help me complete the sentence, no good deed goes unpunished. See, we, we know that, we've lived that, we understand that, and that's kind of what's going on in our text today. Now, uh, Josh Spector uh, was writing about this. He, he was writing about being criticized, and he, he said there are five things, uh, productive things, that we can do when somebody criticizes our work. He said, number one, you can see it as an opportunity. That, that's a good thing. Sometimes when someone criticizes, there's actually a reason, there's some validity. He said, number two, remember you don't have to listen. And, and sometimes we're pretty good at that. And then he says, number three, pause before you respond. How much less would we have to see on our phones if people would just do that one? Just pause before they responded. We'd have much less to, to scroll through. Uh, number four, consider the big picture. And number five, thank your critic. You ever done that? If you want to shut somebody down, if you, if, if you want to shock them, if you want to leave them without a, a way to respond, you just thank them when they criticize you and, and you will have, uh, you'll have accomplished a lot. And so it's a decent list, uh, things that are much easier said than done, especially in the moment of, of emotion and frustration when we've tried to do something well and somebody's chosen to criticize us. Uh, but with that background, we want to get to our text today in Mark chapter 14. Now, I do want to begin uh, and maybe give you more than you want here, but I want to address one uh, challenge with this text that some critics of Scripture have regarded as a discrepancy. There are some people who want to do everything within their power to discredit the Word of God. And, and so the first thing I would say is I do not believe there's a discrepancy but I do bring it up now because for those of you uh, who study a lot and for those of you who were, this is already on your radar, I don't want you to be so hung up on the discrepancy wondering if I'm going to talk about it that you miss out on the important things that are going on in this narrative. And so Mark chapter 14, notice the first couple of verses. The Bible says, now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him, talking about Jesus, by stealth and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. And then verse 3 moves into our narrative for today, while he, talking about Jesus, was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, and we'll come back to that verse. Now, if you've got your Bible, flip over to John chapter 12. It dives into this, to, to this narrative that many of us believe is the very same narrative in a different way. John chapter 12, verse 1 says, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. And so what do we do with this? Matthew, I didn't read Matthew's account, but Matthew's account is like Mark's account. Uh, it talks about a meeting of Jewish leadership that occurred two days before the Passover. The chief priests and elders, the scribes, they're trying to figure out what do we do? How do we, by stealth, take Jesus, seize him, get him out of here? And then Matthew and Mark go on to share the story of this anointing. John's account states that this anointing by Mary actually occurred six days prior to the Passover, not two. So the question is, is this a discrepancy? Because at first reading, it obviously could be perceived that way. Can this potential difference be reconciled? Because there are questions. You know, some would say, well, maybe one of the inspired authors 
well, was just wrong and God let that stand. I don't believe that's the case because when you, if you go down that road, then it opens up a, 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 you open yourself up to a lot of problems. God gave us what he wanted us to have. Uh, so are Matthew and Mark sharing the details of one anointing, one event, while John is sharing the details of a different event? That's possible, but the question, are these two separate anointings, four days apart, almost identical with the, with the apostles that are there being outraged in the exact same way in both cases? It's possible, but it doesn't seem likely to me. The third option would be that all three authors, Matthew, Mark, and John, are describing the same event. And, and so if they are, is there a plausible explanation for the two days out versus six days out statement? Here's where I am as of today. I believe they're describing the same event. I do believe there's a reasonable explanation. It seems that John is correct regarding chronology. The anointing that we're going to read about today occurred six days before the Passover. It appears that Matthew and Mark describe a meeting that occurred two days before the Passover. And then they do a little flashback for context. And, they do, and, and we consume content in that way all the time. I'll be watching something on my iPad, and maybe I've got my phone out too, and all of a sudden what I'm watching makes no sense, and I rewind it 10 or 15 seconds, and I realize that, that the screen came up and said, hey, three months ago, and you're getting a flashback. It happens all the time. We understand how that works. It's a common thing. And so the context, what context would Matthew and, and Mark need to provide here? Well, the question is, what event is it that might have sent Judas over the edge that, that allowed him to be the answer that the, the scribes and the Jewish leadership were looking for? You know, they're looking for a way to seize Jesus. What event set Judas over the edge? Well, it may well have been this anointing that we're reading about in our text today. John also, and so John, if these are the same, John gives us information that's crucial for understanding all of this, this, this inconvenient truth. His name is Lazarus. He's a huge problem for Jewish leadership because Jesus raised him from the dead. It cannot be denied. And here's Lazarus walking around and he's drawing people in like the bearded lady at the fair. I mean, everybody wants to see Lazarus. And so he's a huge problem for them as well. So now I could be wrong. There could have been two separate anointings, but again, it doesn't seem likely to me. So for our purposes today, I'm going to approach Matthew, Mark, and John as all being the same event. Uh, and so that's where I am, and that may be way more than you wanted, but at least you know where I am. Now, from this point forward, Mark's focus in telling the Jesus story is the coming crucifixion for Jesus and what we're looking at today is an anointing. So back to our text, Mark chapter 14, verse 3. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. So Simon the leper, uh, scholars believe this is likely a person that Jesus had healed at some point. Uh, obviously, if Jesus is in his house and he's still alive, that means he's been cured. Because if you've got leprosy, you're an outcast. You don't get to hang out with people. And so they're in the house of Simon the leper. Uh, the other belief here is that Simon the leper may well have been the father of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And that would certainly help account for the close relationship between Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Jesus. They are close friends. John's account says other folks are present. John chapter 12 verse 3 states that, uh, uh, that, that the woman in the text is Mary. She is the sister of Martha. John 12 verse 2 uh, states that Martha is there. And not surprisingly, Martha is serving because that's what she did. That's what she does. She's always involved in a ministry of some sort. And then there's Lazarus, Lazarus that Jesus has raised from the dead. He is the inconvenient truth for Jewish leadership. In fact, John chapter 12, 9 through 11 is very interesting related to Lazarus because it helps us understand why Jesus raised him and the effect that that was having on people. Verse 9, the lar this is John 12, the large crowd of Jews then learned that he, talking about Lazarus, was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, 
but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Why do you raise a guy like Lazarus? To confirm the word that you're preaching. And it was working. And the Jews didn't like that. Back to our text in Mark chapter 14, verse 4. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. And so here's this controversial act, this act of extravagance, this act of, of generosity. And so she does something unexpected, and it, and it stirs up trouble very costly perfume of pure nard and she takes this vial this flask whatever it may be she she pours the oil over Jesus head John chapter 12 verse 3 adds that she also anoints his feet wipes his feet with her hair verse 4 referring back to the idea that no good deed goes unpunished some were indignantly remarking to one another. This is the kind of criticism where I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to my friends over here, but I'm talking about you, and I'm talking to them loud enough that you can hear me talking about you. That, that, that's what they're doing. They're scolding her through their conversations with each other. Why was this oil wasted? Now, we waste things. There was a clean-out at home yesterday. The oldest thing we found, I think, was 2018 in the pantry. We had something we didn't use. We threw it away. Uh, we cleaned out the food thing back here. I think our oldest thing back here in our food pantry was like 2013. You know, so things get thrown away when they don't get... We waste things. They're saying, why did you waste this perfume? And, and, and so, that's a strong word. For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And so they're pitting honoring Jesus against taking care of poor people. And, and thankfully, John's account, again, it provides more insight into what's actually going on here. Go to John chapter 12, verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said... Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this, and here's the insight that you get from John. You get a trip inside the mind of Judas. Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money, he had the money box and he used to pilfer what was put in it. Judas wanted that money so he could have some of it. He didn't care about the poor people. And so when you consider the content of both accounts together, it seems that Judas was the first one of the disciples to be critical. And once he became critical for all the wrong reasons, then the other ones chose to pile on kind of a mob mentality, if you will. And it's not our main point today, but there's a great reminder here for us. We need to be careful, not only about being a critic, but, but also about when we're tempted to agree with a critic. Because often criticism is based in selfishness, it's based in passing judgment, it's not often based in wanting what's best for the person being criticized, or for the Lord, or for the team, whether it's your team, you know, your church family, your work family, uh, a social group that you're a part of. You got to be very careful with criticism. When we start judging people, we're in big trouble because God knows the heart. And we can't. And so this, in, this text, it's enlightening related to Judas. Not only is he the betrayer of Jesus, by inspiration, John tells us he's a thief. All right, Mark chapter 14, verse 6. But Jesus said, here's where Jesus weighs in, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She's done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken of in memory of her. And, and what, how true is that? Here we are today talking about what she did. And so following this criticism by the folks who 
if anybody's not going to criticize, I'll be this guy, these guys, they've been around Jesus more than anybody else, but they're criticizing, and so Jesus seizes this teaching opportunity. Now, we talked about what to do when someone criticizes, the ways we can respond. Good news is, Mary didn't have to respond here. Before she can do anything, Jesus steps in. And what we see from Jesus is he typically does not smile on folks who are being critical of others. We've seen it before in this same family. Luke chapter 10, Jesus is in the home and, and Martha is serving as she always does. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus trying to learn from him. And, and, he, and, and there's no trouble up to the point until Martha gets a little upset with Mary because Mary is just sitting there and she could have been helping with the coffee and helping with the food and helping with all the things that need to be done when you have a guest in the house. And so she starts criticizing her sister. And at that point, Jesus steps in and corrects Martha. He doesn't smile on folks who criticize. And so he calls the actions of Mary here in our text. He says, this was a good deed done to me. You can help the poor anytime, but you don't always have me here in the flesh. Now notice, he doesn't say that those who are in need, he doesn't say that the poor ought to be ignored. He states, she has done what she could. This will be told as a memorial to her. And then you get verses 10 and 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And they were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. And so Jesus' acceptance of this generous anointing, it, it, it may well have been the final straw for Judas. He's been thinking about this. He's been considering this. Jesus is not going to be the king that he wanted Jesus to be. He's not going to sit on a throne. He's not going to have a, a rebellion of some sort. And, and, and so he's been thinking about this. And in a sense, Mary, through this extravagant, generous act, may have unknowingly helped set the betrayal in motion. And so for just a minute or two, I want us to think about the significance of Mary's gift. I mean, what do we need to understand about this? Because you can apply terms like extravagant. You can apply terms like sacrificial. Um, 14 verse 3 of Mark, an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard. I mean, perfume today is expensive. Is there anybody... In the room, if you did, raise your hand, and I think we'll just applaud you or we'll laugh. I don't know what we'll do, but if you're wearing cologne or perfume today that cost you a year's wages to buy, just, just throw your hand up in the air. We, we want to know who you are. I don't, perfume's expensive, but it isn't that expensive, right? But, but when you get into this and understand what's going on, verse 5, this could have been sold for 300 denarii. One denarii was valued at a day's wages for a laborer, so 300 of those would be about, it's a year's worth of work. A year's worth of wages contained in this one flask that gets poured out on Jesus. I mean, it's extravagant. It's sacrificial. And when we think about that, we begin to understand the value of what Mary has just used to anoint the Son of God. It wouldn't have been common for women to have work or career that would have provided significant wealth in that day. Some scholars have speculated this may have been a family heirloom. This may have been something that Mary had inherited somewhere along the way. It's one of those things you get rid of this. It's highly valuable. Maybe you're saving that for a rainy day. And now you don't have that for a rainy day anymore. And in the end, Jesus let it happen. Jesus didn't say it was too much. Jesus didn't say she'd gone overboard. He didn't say the gift shouldn't have been made. He just said, leave her alone. She's done what she could. Why would Mary be willing to do something so sacrificial for Jesus? This extravagant act, this sacrificial act, an act that could have potentially left her vulnerable financially. Why would she do that? Well, here's some things that are possible in the home of Simon the leper. Some believe he's the father of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so if Jesus has healed daddy, 
You're going to be forever grateful to Jesus because you don't want to lose your daddy. You want your daddy around, and Jesus is giving your daddy back because even if daddy's alive with leprosy, he's, he's cut off, he's away from us, he can't be around. But, but now we've got him back. So if Jesus has healed Simon, well, that, that's going to do nothing but make you grateful forever. But here's something we do know, because we don't know about that for sure, but here's what we do know. Jesus had given Mary her brother back. He raised Lazarus from the dead. After Lazarus has been in the grave four days. And so Jesus has likely blessed her in multiple ways. We know she loved to sit at the feet of Jesus and, and allow him to teach and to drink that in and to allow him to bless her life. She loves Jesus. And so here's the big idea. Here's the thing to think about today. The thing that we can still use today. When Jesus means everything. An otherwise unexplainable act of devotion makes perfect sense. Even if it doesn't make sense to anyone else. Another way to say it, properly valuing Jesus results in sacrificial living. Properly valuing Jesus re re results in devotion, sacrificial giving. And so as we think about us today in 2022, do we value Jesus in the way that Mary did. Because Jesus says something that's interesting. For you always, this is verse 7, for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. Now, now we have him in the sense that he saved us and all of that, but we don't have him in the flesh. We cannot do a good deed to him personally in the way that Mary did. What does that mean? That means that the good things we do today for Jesus, on behalf of Jesus, will have to be done to others. And it begs the question, what are we doing for others? As well as, what things could we do, extravagant or otherwise, for Jesus that we're choosing not to do? Do we value Jesus today enough to honor Him in an extravagant way? In a way that might seem highly unusual to the person who doesn't understand who Jesus is. A, a person who maybe doesn't understand what it means to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Sometimes we refer to this statement, she's done what she could. And I, I've heard it used this way even at funerals where we're talking about the life of somebody. And sometimes we use this statement and we're talking about just minor things that, that were under the radar that nobody knew about. And, and, but Jesus isn't using it. And that, that's fine. If that's what you can do, that's what you do. That, that's not wrong. But, but the thing is, Jesus here, he's talking about an amazing, extravagant, risky thing to do. And he's saying, hey, she just did what she could. What if some, uh, what of us, some of us have been positioned by the Lord to do some things for Jesus that are truly extravagant? Chris was here Wednesday night, and he, and he talked about being transformed through generosity. You know, one of the blessings of having worked with, with Heritage so many years doing advancement work is I was able to meet so many people who'd been blessed by God. And in, even in our rich culture, they were blessed to the point that they were doing things that, that were extravagant, that were unexpected, that were just powerful and amazing. I, I, and I've told you, I think about the sweet lady in South Alabama had cancer, had a cancer policy, and, but, but she had enough money. And so because she had cancer and was being paid by this policy, she's, she's training preachers with that. And you're like, who does that? Well, this lady was doing that. I think about this man in Nashville and I would have to go to his home once a year to pick some things up and he'd been very generous, but, but every time I'd get there and I'd get ready to punch the doorbell, it was, it, it was broken. It was broken for years. He, he just never took the time to worry about his doorbell, but then his estate plan, he has treated training ministers and missionaries and Bible teachers. He's given that a child's share of his will. And you're like, who does that? Well, this guy does. It was unexpected. It was extravagant. If God has blessed us and we choose to bless others, Jesus would say, you've done what you can. And perhaps you're thinking at this point, well, sure, but, but, but look at what Jesus, you know, look at what he's done for Mary and her family and look at that relationship. And yes, we can think that way, but then back up for a minute and think about what he's done not only for Mary, 
But for you and for me, for every single one of us, he's given our lives back to us. His, his sacrifice, his going to the cross and dying there and being raised, it means that we don't have to die a spiritual death. His sacrifice means salvation for us. And so through him, we have this great opportunity for eternal life. And so while living here, the call we've answered is not to live selfishly for our own interests. That's not the call we've answered. Paul talked about it, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, beginning. He said, for the love of Christ controls us. One translation says, the love of Christ compels us. It's, it's what we have to do. Having concluded this, that one, talking about Jesus, died for all. That's you and me. Therefore, all died. In other words, if Jesus had to die for all, that means all of us were dead. And he died for all so that they who live choice that we have to make, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. We are to live for him. And as a result, we need to be giving our lives back to him. When Jesus means everything, an extravagant act of devotion makes perfect sense. And in the end... It's interesting that Jesus says, wherever the gospel's preached, wherever the good news goes, this story about this woman is going to be told. And it's a bit ironic, and maybe you've noticed this and maybe you haven't, but Matthew and Mark, in their telling of the story, they don't even give us Mary's name. You have to go to John's account to get her name. And maybe that's a good place to finish today because it helps remind us of why we act, why we do, why we're generous. It's never to be about us. You know, I mentioned the blessing of having gotten to know so many generous folks working with the school through the years. And one of the things that came up with those folks over and over is most of them, they wanted no pomp, they wanted no recognition. Often, if you were trying to honor them in any kind of public way, you, you really had to, to, to drag them into that. And sometimes they just said, no, I don't want my name attached to it. They bless others. Through extravagant acts of generosity, in many cases, they, they just don't want to be known. That's living out Mary's story in modern day life. I'm sure you know some people like that. Some among our church family here at North Highlands are living that story, doing for others on a regular basis. No recognition wanted, no recognition needed, just as needs come up, taking care of those needs, sometimes making extraordinarily amazing sacrificial gifts. We mentioned the passage last week, but it is the why. We come right back to it again today. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. First Peter 2, verse 12. Same sort of message stated in a bit of a different way. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. The way we live our lives, the good that we do, it ought to help position people for salvation. It's never to be about us. It's always about glory to God. And so Will's going to lead us in the song that makes this, uh, this strong statement of affirmation. He is my everything... He is my all. Some of you that are a little older, you may have gone to camp singing that song or sung it in youth group years and years ago. It's a big, strong statement of affirmation. And so the question is, can you sing that today in spirit and in truth? Does Jesus mean everything to you today? Uh, are you a Christian? Have you been baptized into Christ for the mission of your sins? That is step one to making him, to allowing him to be your everything. And then for those of us who are Christians, has God positioned you to honor Jesus in an extravagant way? Can you find a way? This week, to do something for somebody else. Something that will bless them. Something that will shine that big spotlight on Jesus and His sacrifice and His love. Not to make you look good, but to make Him look good. Maybe you need the prayers of the church. Maybe you just need to start over. Maybe you're walking through a valley today that has it difficult for you to even think about doing for others right now. 
If you have a need where our shepherds can pray with you today, they'd love to do that. If you have a need today, please let it be known while we stand and while we sing.